CD and now you can just upload and stream um, information um, onto a computer and listen to, to music, even watches. And I think having a watch and, and the analogy of um, a wristwatch is a very, very interesting analogy because wristwatches were, you know, they've been around for years and years and years. And the first commercial digital watch was produced in 1972 and it sold for $2,100, which is about 12,000 US dollars in today's money. By 1979, the cost of a digital watch was $10. And by 1980, these digital watches were started to be given away in cereal boxes. Now, the slide I've got in front of you here shows a very interesting increase in um, demand for, for conventional watches, for analog watches. And if you have a look at the, inc the incline from 1987 through 2017, you will see that conventional watches have actually grown in popularity rather than decreased in popularity. So analog to digital is not always um, seen as a popular choice. Now, this is a very interesting thing that we can compare to our textile market because we have both worlds um, with us. We have a digital world and we have a conventional print world where we are still printing with rotary screens, with flatbed screens and with digital. And not everybody's migrated. But there is a new philosophy out there which, which talks about old type manufacturing, which really talks about turning things into things where um, you, you're basically converting um, a product from scratch to new type of manufacturing, which really takes um, a product and takes it through a full cycle of activities from research, design and development, production, um, and then delivers it into a closed cycle. So you 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 printing it, you then producing it, and you may even throw it away or recycle it. And there's very little doubt that the introduction of digital printing has brought fantastic new opportunities to the world of decorated textiles. People that are coming into this digital world now are no longer constrained by the high costs of the traditional printing factory where you have to have weaving, you have to have preparation, you have to have uh, bleaching and you, you then print it and you finish it and you know you go through this whole cycle uh, of production. Digital printing really, somebody these days can just buy a digital print machine, put it in their back uh, workshop buy fabric that's been treated and print on it and sell it. So it's becoming a manufacturing sector where almost everybody can do it. And that's a very interesting change to our textile world. But in this transition from an analog world or a conventional world to a digital world, we've learned a few things. So some things can be replaced completely and we don't miss them. For example, the old typewriter. I bet you there's not a single typewriter out there amongst any of our listeners here today. But some things are missed, you know. So uh, if you look at records and the old vinyl records, um, people yearn for the old vinyl records. And in fact, vinyl record production is increasing all the time now. So people want to buy vinyl records and would rather play a vinyl record than listen to something that's streamed. So some things are missed when they're gone, you know, when it's completely gone. For example, I recently experienced um, a situation of being flooded. Our factory was flooded. And the only way that we could contact the outside world, because all the digital towers went down, was by using a very old um, analog phone that we had to plug in and we had to physically dial. And that was the only way that we could contact the outside world. Another thing that we we miss um, because of this digital world is, you know, all of us have got families and it's family time because 
you know, if you've got young kids, you'll know that your kids will get home, they'll get onto their phone and they'll sit in their phone all day, that you won't have any conversation um, and you kind of lose that interaction, that face-to-face -face communication with people. So new is not always better. The Internet of Things with digital manufacturing means that there's a, a potential for the invasion of privacy. You've got the potential for hacking. Um, I think Bruno mentioned it earlier. You know, he turned off his camera because he was afraid that somebody might hack into uh, his environment. And you've got identity theft. Some old things never disappear. You cannot beat the perceived quality, aesthetics, touch and feel of something that has been handmade over machine made. Like mechanical watches, it looks handmade, it feels handmade, there's an old look to it and people like that look. The question is, is the world ready to transfer completely from a conventional printing world to a digital textile printed world? I'm just going to play this video now and I hope you can all see it. I don't think the sound will come through, but I'm hoping that the video will come through. So I'm hoping that everybody sort of um, saw in that video the um, different stages um, of textile printing and what how textile printing has, has transitioned in the past few years. Um, you would have seen rotary machines and flatbed machines um, fairly uh, efficient, but with lots of people standing around um, and working on those machines to digital machines that basically can be set up in a sterile environment and not have very many people working around those machines at all. So it's a very interesting transition. This next slide really looks at what um, sort of um, market influences um, believe is going to happen to the digital um, textile market over the next few years. And you can see in the, in the sort of purple section that um, it is believed that the total textile market value will will grow. OK, COVID has kind of stepped in so that it might uh, it might uh, interrupt that. But it was believed to be growing from 785 billion US dollars to 992 US uh, billion dollars within um, four years. And the same thing with the digital market growth from 1.29 million a billion dollars, apologies, to 2.6 billion dollars by 2021. In square meters, what this means is that um, digital textile printing markets were due to grow 
uh, by almost 224% by volume within four years from um, so lowish volumes in 2016 to higher volumes in 2021. What's very interesting to note, though, is that the rate of growth on conventional textile printing markets was projected to grow, not at the same rate, but it is still projected to grow at a rate of 3%. So these are quite interesting projections. And on the right-hand side of that slide, you'll see um, history. You'll see history. So you'll see the actual growth, and these are actual measured growth. It's not projections. Um, of the digital textile market from 2014, um, where there was 955 million square meters, to 2017, where there was almost 1.9 billion square meters. Uh, and you look at the number of installed digital printers over the same period of time, it grew from 25,000 machines installed worldwide to 39,000 digital printers installed worldwide. The next slide shows really why the digital printing world is so appealing. On the left-hand side, where all of the blocks are green, it's a conventional route to market on a conventional uh, rotary or a flatbed printing machine. And you'll see that a, um, a design comes up from a customer. Uh, it goes through design assessment, your separation artists get their hands in it, it goes to CAD, screens are engraved, you then have screen approvals, screen proofing, the customer's got to approve the screen proofing, it then goes to strike offs, you do lots of colorways and the customer's then got to approve those colorways, eventually it goes to bulk. Now those of you that um, know the, the textile printing market, the conventional printing market, that process Take. Sorry, I've got some feedback, uh, Yogesh. Uh, sorry, that, that process could take um, up to 12 weeks. Look at the ex on the extreme right hand side of that um, slide, and you'll see that fast fashion is already using this concept of going from design straight through to CAD. To it, you miss out all of the design assessment, the, the, the separation artists are missed out, your screen engravings missed out, your customer approvals missed out. It just goes straight to a sort of shade and design check stage and to bulk printing. And that can take two to three weeks. So you're moving your cycle time on a textile print from 12 weeks to about two weeks. And that is the huge appeal because you're missing out lots and lots of stages in the process, you're missing out lots and lots of people, and therefore you're missing out lots and lots of cost. I'd also like you to just consider, you know, if you were going into the textile market as a, as a new person and you wanted to set up a new conventional printing factory, the approximate cost to set up this factory, and these are just ballpark figures, would be in the region of about 4.8 to 5 million pounds. That's just on equipment cost. That's before you can produce one meter of printed fabric. If you decided to set up a modern digital print factory, you could purchase a digital print machine for as little as 350,000 pounds, even less now, a rotary heat press of about 20,000 pounds with a total outlay of 370,000 pounds, and you could have your first meter going into the market within weeks. It's a phenomenal um, attractive offer for people that are wanting to get into the digital print market and to break into that market. And it really moves your manufacturing from a make it all process where you're doing everything from weaving, singeing, scouring, bleaching through to printing to a buy and then make um, environment where you buy the fabric in, you print it on your digital machine and you inspect it and out it goes. So it's a lot quicker, a lot simpler. So I'll just summarize what I've said um, in the past few slides. Digital is growing significantly. The growth projections to 2021 have been estimated to 1.95 billion square meters. Sorry, from 1.95 billion square meters to 4 billion square meters. Conventional printing, however, is still relevant. 
only 5% of printing is digital. But digital offers cheap entry into the textile print market, which means that people will jump into that market as pretty quickly. Digital printing also cuts out massive chunks from the digital uh, conventional printed textile lead time. The current main players in digital printing are Europe, the Far East, um, and they um, sort of occupy over 70% of the current print capability. So as a manufacturer, you have to ask yourself a few questions here. Digital is really a threat if you're a conventional printer. How do you stay ahead of the pack? Is digital printing even relevant for you? And am I doing everything I can be to be successful? Uh, if you're hungry, you'll even ask yourself what you're going to have for dinner. I apologize for that bad uh, comedic interlude. So what are the issues that are holding back the pace of change from conventional to digital? So what I've tried to do here is I've tried to identify what um, a digital footprint looks like to a conventional footprint. And the little green square at the bottom of that slide shows the difference between digital and conventional printing when it comes to um, innovation and technology. So digital is really a design-led industry. You focus on design rather than equipment and process capability because the equipment is more or less the same from one supplier to the next. You'll know um, in a conventional market, you've got a huge choice of machines to choose from, and you may wish to go for a rod uh, magnet system or a blade system or a combination of rod and blade. You may even want to go for um, a flatbed application. So uh, it's very much restricted um, choice with regards to uh, equipment. So it becomes very design led. You also have infinite design freedom on digital. You can design what you want. You're not restricted by the number of colors that your printing machine can do. Um, but you have more limited color freedom because your color space is a lot more limited. You're dealing with theoretical color space, whereas on conventional printing, you can mix colors and you can do all sorts of things with different shades, different dye stuff groups. Um, you've got a lot more to choose from as a printer. Digital has limited technical freedom. You can't do special effects yet. You can't improve your push through. You can't do lots of things that you can do on a conventional print machine. You know where your printer, you know, the skill of your printer is there to, to adjust the weight, to adjust the angle of your squeegees, to do lots of different things. You can't really do that with a digital machine. At the moment on digital, quality and fitness for purpose is secondary to design appeal. Now, we live in a throwaway society. So is this important? So people are prepared to compromise on specifications at the moment for digital. As long as it looks good, it doesn't have to have fantastic fastness properties. Um, and this is quite an important thing to note because this is what new entrants to the markets are um, hanging their hats on. Um, they know that customers want to buy fabrics that look good and don't necessarily perform well um, in particular sectors. Um, the other thing I'd say on uh, digital is you have a limited choice of substrate because your print heads are still not at a point where they uh, are able to withstand some of the heavier gauge fabrics, some of the, the fabrics that have got lots of slubs, that have got lots of neps. Um, and fabrics that are hairy, because all of these fabric imperfections uh, cause significant problems for your print heads. Now, as a conventional printer, you don't have that problem. So you end up with a different footprint um, for innovation and technology. If you look at skills, um, you also end up with a very different footprint. On digital, the skill of the designer in the interpretation of the initial idea can almost act independently on the skills of the rest of the business. Now, what I'm saying here is, you know that if you're a conventional printer, 
the designer can design the most fantastic design in the world, but your machines will not be able to produce it because you've got limitations. So your skill of your designer becomes almost more important than your skill of your printer with digital. In color matching, um, your, the skill of your, of your colorist um, is still a massive issue because it takes a long time even for a digital printer to get the color 100% right. In fact, it probably takes the colorist longer to get a shade right on digital than it does in conventional. Conventional, you know, the, the conventional color matching skills have been developed over hundreds of years. So it is easier to get a shade right on conventional printing than it is on digital printing. In digital, your printer skills are virtually made redundant. You don't need any skill as a printer. You need somebody who can press a button on a print machine and it will start printing what the designer has designed. But in conventional, your skill of the printer often makes the difference between one product to the next. And your printer is almost one of the most important people because they enable market differentiation. Um, in digital, the preparation and finishing is a significant requirement. You've got to have good, clean, hairless fabric to print digital. So that's almost more important than the skill of the printer. Um, and the other issue is on substrate variability. So we've already spoken about this in the previous slide where the substrate actually makes a massive difference about what you can do. Um, and here the weaver's skill um, still gives the conventional printer a significant edge. Um, most of your digital print fabrics are quite boring, flat fabrics. Whereas conventional printing, you can still print on pretty fantastic um, slubby fabrics with real interesting uh, effects that the weavers produce. Um, and that gives a real uh, advantage for a conventional um, printing house. So the skill footprint looks different. Um, from an efficiency perspective, digital is perceived as faster to market, but that's not always correct because the productivity, when it comes to the printing part of the process, is actually not as fast, if I, if I can put it to you that way. You know, um, putting a putting a fabric onto a digital print machine is fine. You've still got to get the color right. You've still got to prepare that fabric. You've still got to finish that fabric. So effectively, it's not that much faster going from digital um, print from design through to, to final stage as conventional. I would say they almost the same um, if, you, if you're wanting a really good quality digital print. Um, efficiency, again, the fabric cleanliness is absolutely critical. So you can't be overly quick. You've got to make sure that you take time to get your fabric clean, to get your fabric well prepared, to get it um, prepared with inkjet solution. Um, you've got to do this to protect your print heads. Um, digital print also requires the application of inkjet solution. So it adds extra cost. Um, the cost of inkjet dyes and the inkjet application of um, preparation solution is probably still a lot higher than it is in conventional printing. Um, in digital, the rate of manufacture is governed by the colorist. The colorist holds the key to getting the product out uh, quicker. Um, now, if you're color matching in digital, those of you that have been involved in the digital game know that it is not as easy to shade match to the standards that are required using conventional color space as it is to um, using print paste. And then finally, your productivity and capability in digital is governed by the machine speed. You can't run a digital machine from zero meters per minute to 100 meters a minute. They have a set speed. Whereas in conventional printing, you can run that machine at five meters a minute, or you can run that machine at 80 meters a minute, depending on what your end use is. So your efficiency footprint, again, looks very different from a digital and a conventional perspective. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit on agility and cost. Um, digital, um, you have far less restrictions with run lens. Um, you can run 100 meters, you can run five meters. Now the conventional print guys will know that you will not set up a conventional print machine for five meters, but a digital person will be able to do that. There are less upfront costs on digital, but, but digital print costs still outweigh conventional print costs because the raw materials and processing costs in preparation for printing are higher in many cases. Generally, the minimums that you're going to run are lower in digital, but not always. Some digital print suppliers are now insisting on higher minimums, particularly on single pass machines and on these machines that can run at 100 meters per, per minute. Um, and there are some fantastic digital machines out there now. One of the big disadvantages of digital is one machine can only produce one die group. So if you buy a reactive digital machine, you can only produce reactive inks uh, on that. If you buy a pigment machine, you can only produce pigments. Whereas in conventional printing, you can produce vats one day, reactives the next day, disperse the next day. So you've got a lot more flexibility with, um, with the products that you can print. Um, initially, um, the cost of digital machines is high, but once you get the machine up and running, the process costs get lower and lower. Importantly, the, the cost of running a digital ma machine from a manpower perspective is far lower than uh, conventional. Um, you only need one printer to look after three to four uh, digital machines. Um, and if you're running a conventional print machine, you probably need three to four people to look after one machine. So it works in the opposite way. Um, digital dealing with quality issues can be expensive. And because of the newness of the technology, it's very often difficult to identify the root causes um, of quality issues. Whereas with conventional um, printing, it's been around for so long that mostly you know where to look to deal with those quality issues. So again, your quality, you, sorry, your agility and cost print footprint look very different um, from a digital and conventional perspective. When you put all these things together, you will see that the footprint of digital is very, very different to the footprint of conventional. And the green lines indicate a digital footprint and the blue lines indicate a conventional footprint. Now, all of these things together mean that when your, when your customer looks at the fabric, they will see a difference between conventionally printed product and digitally printed product. It's a little bit like what I said earlier in this presentation, where I said people look at an analog watch and they look at a digital watch and they decide what their preference is. There are some customers that still want the look of a conventional printed product, but there are some customers where that look is not as important. So these products will look different and your customers will decide on what they want to go for in the future. I'm going to skip through that next slide, but this slide really just looks at um, the skills that remain important uh, on the digital versus the conventional. So if you look at the pink line, digital, you'll see the skill of the weaver is important, but the skill of the conventional colorist isn't. But the skill of the digital colorist becomes more important. The skill of the technician, preparation and finishing is key. The engraver is no longer required but the artists and designers remain key. And then the rest of them, the skill of the printer becomes not necessary. It's all about um, moving from this conventional world where you have a handmade feel to a digital world where it looks and feels very different. So if you're a conventional printer, what can you do about it? and you haven't uh, purchased a digital machine, well, focus on stability, reliability, and predictability. Your customers will want that. You need to make sure that your customer relationships are good and you have good new product development. You have capability and capacity. 
that possibly digital printers don't have. But you need to think about digital printing. You need to think about making sure that you have a future. And if your customers are starting to dig around in digital, you will find that they will quickly want to move to digital because they will want to overcome some of the restrictions on conventional printing. The digital printers, uh, if you don't have conventional, well, you need to focus on quick turnaround and being first to market. You need to make sure that you build your reputation quickly because your reputation is new. Um, you need to try and find ways to be innovative and to grow your capacity because, as I mentioned earlier, your capacity is fairly restricted on a digital machine. And also, you need to consider going into new ways of selling. So instead of going the conventional route to market where you go through um, a buyer, perhaps, and they sell into their customers, maybe you want to go directly into your customers. Um, and there's some fantastic um, businesses out there at the moment doing exactly that. Um, and I speak about Spoonflower based in the US, uh, and they now have a branch open in Europe, and uh, Nitin. Um, and Nitin is a really interesting concept where you can go in and design a jersey on an iPad and go back in an hour's time and your, and your jersey is knitted in the colors that you want and you can just purchase it and go out of the shop. One thing I would say is that mature businesses, so, so the digital, or so the, sorry, the conventional printers that have been a, around a long time, your businesses have got skills, technologies, and, knowledges, uh, and knowledge that new entrants to the market don't have. So you need to use these skills and you need to make sure that you keep hold of these assets to make sure that you protect yourselves against these new digital print guys coming in. Your company history will have core competencies that, that protect you. And they, your relationships with your customers um, and your existing reputation will act as a barrier for a certain amount of time. <laughs> Inevitably, the digital machines are going to start taking and encroaching into your market. The other advantage that you have as an existing digital conventional printer is you can reconfigure your factory quickly to digital. So you can launch new products, you know the technology, you know you know everything there is to know about fabrics. You know everything to, there is to know about um, finishing fabrics that digital printers don't know yet. So you can very quickly change from a conventional printer to a digital printer and use your employee knowledge and skills because they are the key competitive advantages that you have in a mature market. I'm just going to take a drink of water. Remember to be careful that your employees are going to be fearful of change. And even your customers are going to be fearful of change. Some customers like rotary printed product. They may not want to go to digital printed product. You need to be very, very carefully watching the cost of manufacture because the digital print sector will tell you that the cost of manufacture is far cheaper. But be sure of that. Make sure you do your homework before you go and purchase a new digital print machine. It's not always cheaper and some of the costs are hidden. So just be careful when you go into it. Um, and just be careful as well. Don't underestimate the uh, born global um, innovators. So the new entrants to the market, market, the people that don't have any textile um, background, what they are prepared to do is they're prepared to test the boundaries more than us conventional printers were. So don't underestimate uh, the new digital print world. So I just would like to um, offer these challenges uh, in closing. If you're a digital machine manufacturer, because of the restrictions in digital, you might want to start identifying the product development requirements that you need from your equipment to gain further traction in the printing market. Um, you need to come up with a plan to be able to print special effects. 
to be able to uh, modify the rate of push through that you have on fabrics, to be able to do the things that a conventional print machine can do than a, that a digital print machine can't do. If you're uh, an editor or a buyer and you are only buying digital, you might want to consider whether going digital only will restrict your product offering because you know, if you go into into a, a, a shop, you can very quickly tell whether something has been printed digitally or whether it's been printed conventionally. And printing digitally means that you get a far smaller range of technical capabilities than you can with a conventional print product. So it might be best if you're in that sort of business to make sure you spread your range between digital as well as conventionally printed product. If you're a textile print factory owner, um, you need to really consider very carefully whether you want to go into the digital print market. I would recommend that you start doing that because digital is starting to grow everywhere. You can see the rate of growth um, the rate of growth is not based on projections, it's based on historical fact. Um, and I think that anybody who is a conventional printer who has not started looking at digital printing, you're already starting to fall behind in the marketplace and you're giving your competitors an edge over you that is very difficult to catch up on once your competitors uh, have been established in the market. And that is the end of my presentation. I uh, thank you for your uh, perseverance. I apologize if it's been a little bit too long, um, but thank you for listening. Thank you, Gavin. I think that was a wonderful presentation. It was extremely realistic and uh, quite to, I think, uh, a surprise. It was, uh, it gave a very good understanding about how uh, people can see the printing world, the digital versus the the rotary and other uh, printing methods. Uh, can I ask everybody to just uh, switch off their videos? Uh, Mr. Rajesh S, I think your video is uh, on. So if you can just uh, switch off your videos. Uh, because of some technical hitches, I was not able to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Gavin. Uh, Gavin Thatcher is a uh, is the uh, chair of SDC. And I will just uh, give me some minutes. Mr. Rajesh S, if you can just. Uh, uh, you guys should take him out of then is better. Yeah. So basically, uh, if you can uh, see my screen. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can see the screen. Yeah, so we recently had a change in our trustee team. And if you can see here, uh, we had a, a new president. Can I ask everybody to keep your mics muted at all times? Mr. S. Babu. Yes. Yeah. So basically, uh, we had some changes in our trustee team. Uh, uh, we have a new president, um, uh, John Hemsford. He has been a treasurer for a very long time, and now he's our president. Uh, we had our ex trustee. Just a second. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Rutkin was our ex trustee. Uh, and uh, Gavin is now replaced him as a chair of the uh, SDC C trustees. So that's, I think, uh, a little bit uh, knowledge about the changes. I would now then uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, I think can hear you. We can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Right. Rogers. Yeah, just a second. 
So basically, I'll just see, say my screen because there, it, then it is more more easy to to say what I want to say. Yeah, uh, Mr. Gavin Thatcher, uh, I forgot uh, we do, uh, because of the sharing uh, problems, we didn't we are not able to introduce him. Mr. Gavin Thatcher is is a chair of uh, SDC. He started his career in South Africa with Dagama Textiles. A true textile colorist, uh, being a dyer, a printer, a finishing, and I think uh, he did, uh, did an excellent job in presenting us various aspects of printing, uh, digital versus rotary. I think some rare insight of how rotary printers can, you know, uh, outsmart digital printings and how what advantages digital printing has over the others. So, uh, thank you, Gavin. And I think uh, you wanted to leave uh, the webinar. So I think we can grant him leave for that. Uh, before that, uh, Gavin, do you want to say anything? No, I just, uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, any questions from, it was really an interesting uh, presentation. So if there is any questions, do put it on the chat box. Or if there are any, uh, we can take, take it later or email it to uh, to you. So, so basically, uh, uh, Gavin, I think we can take the uh, questions later on, and uh, I will send you via mail, so we can. Okay, you know, no, no okay. problem. Thank you, thank you very thank much, you. everybody. Enjoy the rest of your uh, of your webinar. Thank you, thank you very much. So, just uh, come back to this thing. Uh, Society of Dyes and Colorist is based in Bradford, UK. We have been established in 1884. We are a Charity, uh, registered charity with the Royal Charter, and uh, basically our mission is our mission is to be an outstanding provider of education and community engagement for studying and working with color. So basically, we uh, there's a book on SDC called the Servant of Color. So that is what we really have. We have a mission to be to serve color in whatever capacity we can. We are proud. To uh, have SDC because we have a royal charter, we can have our qualifications. So you can have a chartered colorist. This is the only qualification given by SDC in the world. Uh, uh, it's a chartered body, so we have a uh, chartered colorist. The route to this is ASDC or FSDC. So if you have, uh, if you have contributions to the society, to the industry, you can go take the fellowship uh, as well as you can take the ASDC if you have enough qualification and experience. You can take the ASDC by exemption and then apply for a chartered colorist. So we are the only organization in the world who, have, who can have, give this qualification. If you want to stay connected with SDC, you can just go to color.network uh, and basically fill this form, which is on your screen now, and you can stay connected with us. Something which we are really proud of uh, across the uh, years. Uh, I think, uh, Whatever webinars which are taking place across the globe, now they are available on SDC platform, and you can see a recording of those of those web, uh, of, of webinars on the SDC web, uh, website. If you are a member, you get free access. If you are not a member, then you need to buy. The cost is almost like five pounds, so very very small. But if you be, want to become a member, do become a member and uh, join the SDC family. This is the SDC design competition, this we, which we do every year. And I think uh, because of the COVID, this has been hold on. But I think definitely this will, uh, uh, we will do something about it and, and start it. Till now, we don't have any much uh, updates on this. So I will start with a new, uh, new presenter, uh, Mr. Kamal Kulushetra. I think you can see him on the screen now. Uh, he's a textile engineer. And I spoke to him before this presentation about a lot of printing, and we had a huge deliberation about how we can improve the digital uh, world. And uh, fantastic. I mean, the knowledge that he has, the expertise that he has is really remarkable uh, through technical textile technicians and mechanical as well as uh, electronic engineering. So I think Kamalji, I will uh, unshare uh, myself, and then you can start your presentation. So I have unshared. And Kamalji. Yeah, I can hear you, yes. Yeah. 
you can then now start your presentation and share your screen yes sure i'll start just before that i'll just mute everybody and then mute and you can unmute yourself yeah All right. Uh, good morning. Good evening. I think also good afternoon to everybody. Yeah. All right. Well, my name, as uh, Yogesh already announced, is Kamal Kunshrisht. I work for Colorjet. Colorjet India Limited is a company which manufactures digital uh, printers. It is actually the largest uh, digital inkjet printers in India. And. Uh, Textile digital printers is our business. So I will. Uh, I'll come. I'll, I'll. I'll be explaining a few things about uh, uh, digital textile printing. It is very difficult to cover everything about digital printing. Although it's a new beast, although it's a newcomer, it's uh, still. I think I have a little difficulty with my audio. Anyway, I hope it will be corrected as we go along. So, I will cover different aspects about uh, digital printing. Some of the slides that you will see uh, would uh, require me to uh, do. Let me know as soon as you stop hearing me, because then I'll know. So, what I know is that uh, some of the slides that you will see will uh, will make you feel that a lot more could be said about them. Uh, I, I I would agree with you, but there's only the, I have tried to make the make this presentation more extensive than intensive. Uh, you know, and at the end of this presentation, the purpose is uh, not to arrive at a conclusion, but to make you think about digital. That's the purpose of my presentation. That's what I mean. It makes you think it's good. Uh, so I think we can start with the present. Okay. Uh, word before the, you know, Gavin, Gavin gave a fantastic introduction, he gave a launch pad. There would be some divergence with what Gavin was saying. Uh, if uh, we could be having a freewheeling conversation, it would be very interesting, but that's not the uh, format of this uh, webinar. So he has said his, his, said his part. If you have listened carefully to him, and now if you listen carefully to me, probably you will find there are certain divergences. I'll, I'll, I'll try to point out, point them out as we go along. So let's look at the textile value chain first of all. This, uh, we all know the finished product, maybe garments, uh, home furnishing or whatever is made from textile, even uh, some uh, baggage fabric is also you know, printed. It starts with the fiber, start the fiber, the material of the fiber, fiber type, the yarn characteristic, how much is the twist? I mean, fiber type, polyester cotton, and cotton also, which kind of cotton? And then the then the yarn characteristic, the twist, whether it's a you know it's hard twisted or not hard twisted, whether it's filament or what, and then the fabric construction, everything makes a difference to the final product. Digital printing is just one uh, it is a step in this value addition from fiber to the finished product okay there is something called rfd and rfdp for some people maybe it's those are sounds latin rfd is ready for dyeing ready for dyeing is basically the fabric that you uh, have from the fabric that is formed maybe knit maybe woven maybe warp knit it has to be processed before it can be printed or dyed in this case we call it ready for dyeing because now the fabric is ready to take in the dye or to be printed. Now, digital printing requires a step in between. So we saw in Gavin's presentation that the total number of steps in digital printing are less. But this is important. Not in every digital printing, and we'll see the number of uh, the types of digital printing that we have. I will also touch upon that in the later slides. But RFTP is ready for digital printing. So there is a step in between RFD and digital printing. So 
Okay. Uh, I, uh, I would like to, of course, Kevin has shown you uh, conventional printing, how it looks like. I also have a clip, so why not have a look at it? So the, the reason that there's a purpose why I'm showing this clip, it's, from, it's on YouTube. It's not something that is very special. It's a screen printing machine, a flat screen printing machine. Here it shows, uh, you know, the fabric is moving on the bed and the fabric moves intermittently. If, so, it will have, and the screen printing will have as many printing stations as the number of colors that you desire. I, I suppose everyone knows what a conventional printing, screen printing looks like. So I just uh, stop this and we can go to the next slide. We go directly to the digital, the modern day digital printer. Uh, this is a uh, modern day digital printer of the multi-pass scanning type. Now we saw that in the flat screen printing that we saw earlier in the clip, the fabric moved intermittently. And there also the printing was actually done perpendicular to the fabric movement direction. The fabric was moving in a direction perpendicular to the print direction. You saw how the screen was, how the squeezy was moved perpendicular to the fabric movement. Same thing is happening here, but there is no squeezy here. They're just print heads. It's moving perpendicular to the fabric direction. So there are two movements. The X, we call in digital printing, we call it the X and the Y. So there's the printing, the, the carriage. What you see moving is called the carriage. It has a array of, array of print heads. It's moving in the X direction and the fabric is moving in the Y direction. You can see the colors and you probably observe the seamless changeovers from yellow to green to what's printing now is blue. Uh, you could also have noticed these subtle shade variations. That's what a modern printing machine does. Digital ink, inkjet printing. We print, uh, the digi digital printing, we use uh, CMYK. CMYK is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. We use these inks in these four colors to produce uh, millions of colors. Uh, sometimes, uh, if you want to, if you if CMYK is not good enough, you want to dazzle them some more, uh, then you may add additional color, additional inks. I mean, color is a misnomer here because color is what you get is the you know the color that you see on the fabric on the, of the of the design is actually a mix of CMYK plus two or plus four or plus eight inks. So they can be up to twelve different inks. So it used to be just four inks. Uh, a decade ago or something like that. Then, uh, but now it's very, very common to find eight ink printers and now some manufacturers also offer a 12 ink printer. Just to show you that uh, why uh, the additional two and four colors are needed because they, they serve to expand the color gamut. No? This, is, this is an image that uh, my application engineer shared with me. So when you use just four wings, CMYK, this is what the frog would look like. Oh, this is not a frog, this is the chameleon. And uh, if you use eight, then it suddenly becomes brighter. This is because of the enhanced color gun. Just to show you the difference. I mean, this is already good and looks good, but this looks better. Digital printing is, the most important part of digital printing is the print head. Printhead has nozzles. Printhead constitutes nozzles. It has, multi, it has a number of nozzles through which ink is jetted. What is in these nozzles? These ink, the nozzle is, uh, is made with the piezoelectric material. A piezoelectric material is a very uh, unique in the sense that it is, it, is, it is a substance that can change, that changes form, that changes shape when an electric impulse is applied to it. And this property is reversible. As soon as you remove the electric field, it reverse, reverses back to its original shape or form. And this property is what, what is used in the printhead. And it is used and to, to produce tiny ink drops jetted at high speeds from those nozzles on the fabric or on paper or, or any sub, other substrate. This is basic inkjet. Inject printing. Digital 
is, I mean, the digital inkjet printing, it's, it's one word, digital inkjet. There's nothing, to, because digital is something that you have in Rotary also, but what the difference is the inkjet. And this is how the inkjet works. You, you have probably seen the animation, so I don't need to explain it. The drops are being emitted. It's a, it, uh, and uh, and uh, in digital printing, we measure the drop size in picoliters. Picoliter is, say, one million cubic millimeter. So that's the magnitude, uh, the scale. That, that's the scale in which we work in digital printing. How is the image? How do you get the resultant colors on your fabric? It is nothing but a collection of dots. What we see on the fabric is actually a spray. You, you have all, I mean, not all of us, probably some of us are too young, probably have tried this. But I, as a child, have tried spray painting. We took a wire mesh and we dipped the, a toothbrush into some color, watercolors, rubbed the bristles on the net, and what you have on paper below it is a wonderful spray effect. Now, this is something similar, except that each dot is controlled. The placement of each dot is controlled, and the dot is really very tiny. That is digital thinking. OK, uh, as I said, the, the printhead is the most important part of digital printing. And this is what a printhead looks like. So this is just one printhead. In this case, what you see here is a Koenig and an Ulta printhead. Uh, you will see. So in the in the video that we saw, I think, OK, the printheads, now we, we, we saw that how the digital printing was printing. You know, the carriage was moving from left to right, or it was moving perpendicular to the fabric direction. Now, this carriage can have four printheads, and each printhead can be connected to a ink. So in this case, it is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And there are four printheads, to, so you, which are printing with four colors. If you want a, eight colors, you can add another four here, and you can connect those inks right here, and so on. And you can have multiple. You can have maybe uh, 32 heads. Maybe you can have 64 heads, and so on. You can have multiple heads. But basic, this is the basic arrangement. They are in line, or they are in staggered. Like this. Just to take you back to the video, so that, uh, you know, like, can understand uh, this here in the in the this carriage that you see here this is where the print heads are arranged are configured and uh, when and the ink is being pumped into the print heads and so there is a direct linkage between the firing frequency or the rate at which the drops are fired. They are actually jetted, but they're so, the, the, the velocity is so high that you, it's often termed as firing frequency. So printing speed is a function of the firing speed, the, the jetting speed of the printhead. And, and it is also a function of the number of printheads. And it is a number of, it's a function of the number of things because if you have more inks, then you need more heads. And it is a function also of the print width. When, when I say the print width, it means you know, here it would print, it shows the, the print length here. I, I don't know if you can see my cursor. It shows 131 millimeter. This one stays 67 millimeter. So in one movement, it will cover a few centimeters more than this one. So that's the difference. There's no, Konica Minolta is just one printhead manufacturer. There are others. There are Kyocera, there is Epson, and so on. And they all have they all have their characteristics. They all have their uh, you know native drop size and uh, this kind of uh, uh, terminology which is associated with printheads. As I said, every slide we could you know go into a lateral discussion on every slide, but you also have to move forward. So I'll go to the next slide. Now, uh, look at categories and uh, how many digital printing types do we have? So we, what we saw was a, was a direct-to-fabric printer. It was a scanning type. But we also have something called garment printing. One is a fabric printing. Then there's a, you can look at digital printers in terms of what they print on. So it's fabric printing versus garment printing. 
direct to fabric versus transfer paper. So you print on paper and then you transfer it. This is, this is, this is transfer paper works only for polyester, not for any other function. Uh, direct to fabric, we already saw the video. It was printing directly on the fabric. And uh, scanning versus single pass. Now I'll explain what the single pass is in the next uh, slide. So scanning is what is commonly, uh, you know, which is commonly found. Single pass is the latest we have. It's very high speed. Then you can have a digital inkjet printer with belt or without belt. A sticky belt on which the fabric moves. Um, then you can differentiate between digital printers on the basis of inks that is used in those printers. So it can it can have a digital inkjet printer. As Gavin pointed out very rightly, a digital inkjet printer is usually configured for a specific ink. So if a digital inkjet printer, if you're buying a digital inkjet printer from the manufacturer today with pigmenting, it is not easy. Okay, it's not impossible, but it's not easy to convert it to reactive or any other ink system, even though it may be direct to target. I'm audible, right? I'm audible, right? Yeah, yeah. So, right. I would go a step further. In fact, some of you might already be aware that there is, besides these broad classifications, you know, digital engine printer is very new. It is. It is a disruptive technology that has come into textile. It is, it is uh, generating new business models, uh, which you, you you probably know already know about. But there is also something which is happening all the time. There is there people are attempting to make hybrid digital printers. Hybrid digital printers as combining the best of both conventional printing and digital printing in one machine. So that is what is a hybrid printer. Then there are some, some are some are still at an idea stage. For example, somebody actually asked me to ask me if he can print on yarn. So he is looking to print on the warp sheet. So when he leaves this printed warp sheet, when the print digitally printed warp sheet, when he prints it, when he starts weaving it, he'll probably create a, a very uh, uh, probably never seen before kind of a chambray effect in the fabric. That feature, it's not, it does not exist. Uh, this is a single pass printer. The schematic, uh, uh, it's a rough drawing of a single, what a single pass printer would uh, look like. So as against the, the, the most, the, as against the, uh, the norm, the scanning type printer, in a single pass printer, the fabric does not move intermittently. It moves continuously. In this case, I'm trying to show that the fabric is moving from left to right. These are, this is, this is just a two-dimensional drawing, but if you can imagine uh, rows of stationary printheads with cyan, magenta, and yellow and black into the screen, into your screen, right, the depth. There's a row of, there's a row of uh, printheads on uh, cyan and magenta and yellow and black. And these are stationary, and they are printing on the fabric, which is passing under it. But the fabric is moving continuously. The printers are getting signal from the print manager as to what to print. And the ink supply, of course, is like the other machine also. It's the same thing. And uh, here, uh, there's a sticky belt going around. So this is this is the single pass printer. 70 meters per minute, or even said 100 meters per minute, or something like that. Yeah, well, that's possible. This 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 high speed machine also exists. So digital printing is not just low speed; it's also high speed. It can be, you know, when we you could compare it to a rotary printing uh, system, where uh, you have uh, the, the cylinders here and uh, the fabric is moving continuously. The root, the, the cylinders are moving, and you are printing on the fabric. Of course, you need as many cylinders. As there are colors in this in the rotary in the conventional system, rotary printing machine. Whereas on the digital printer, you don't need that. You just four inks or eight inks are enough to create millions of colors. How does digital printing work? First, you get your design. 
you have to make your design. It's the image file. This image file has to be rasterized. What is rasterizing? Rasterizing is nothing but converting the, uh, it's, it's basically translating the image file into a language of bits and bytes that can be processed by the printer. This is this this one this uh, translated set of instruction is the rip file. So you would have heard people saying the rip file. This is where you get a rip file. Rasta image processing. This rip file is is a series of instructions that makes the machine is exactly the right ink in the right quantity at the precise place it is needed so that all the millions of dots all the trillions of dots come together to make uh, to create the illusion uh, to the human eye that because it's it's if you at a microscopic level it's just a collection of dots but to the human eye the illusion is that of a fish a rose or a flower or or any intricate pattern that you, that you have seen in the image file here it's no longer uh, but it still remains a collection of dots Okay, here, this was an interesting, uh, well, not in, it happens all the time, but, but it's an it's a actual uh, situation. This uh, print design that you see on the screen was given to me by uh, somebody who was considering investing in digital printer. And uh, this is their uh, design. design, And uh, on a conventional system, they would have used these five colors to print it. So this design in the conventional system is printed with five colors. You can see some numbers here, and these are because every color, every shade is, you, you know, I mean, we don't say anymore it's because printing is technical, it's a, it's a very technical job. And we don't say anymore that, uh, you know, it's uh, the tamarind uh, red or something like that. We just identify the shade with the number. Now we took this design, we ripped it. So it was a design file. It was a JPEG file or something. We ripped it. And what we had, we ripped it with the same. You know, these are this is a design file with five colors. We ripped it with a profile of eight inks. And we ripped it with a profile of four inks. And we found, I mean, when, when we ripped it with profile of eight inks, we used cyan, light cyan, magenta, light magenta, yellow, black, blue, and orange. And the quantity of ink required was, by as per the rep software, was around five square meters, five milliliter per square meter. So five milliliter per square meter is the total amount of ink that you need when you use eight inks to print this pattern on the panel. But with, and when you use four inks instead of eight, you still reach, of course, there could be a slight variation in the color, but it, I, with this design, it was possible and we, we consume a little less, just a little less. It is also possible, it, the interesting part here is it's also possible that the same, you know, with the same, uh, you could use the same eightings to produce slightly deeper shade, depending upon the fabric, you could produce slightly deeper shades by increasing the ink quantities a little bit. So five, from 5.06 milliliter per square meter to 6.74 milliliter per square meter, you had a slightly deeper colors. Digital printing process, they are, uh, I think, uh, as we saw in the slides, uh, the earlier slide, how the, the, the different types of digital printing. So there is sublimation or transfer paper printing. This is actually not printing on textile at all. This is the sublimation printing is printing on paper. A machine, the digital printer is printing on paper. It is printing on paper with an ink type called the sublimation ink. We call it sublimation ink because uh, the, 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 the printing on fabric is carried out with, uh, as, a, as a method of heat transfer, a roll-to-roll -roll heat transfer. So that printed paper and the fabric is passed through a heating press, a rotary heat press, and the ink sublimates and is captured by the uh, fabric, polyester fabric, and you get a printed fabric. We, I have a slide which shows you what kind of printing, the fabric that is, 
was created with uh, this edit. But this is works only for Polystyrene. Now, we, you know, this is this is a, this is a, it is it is a fallacy which I often come across as a salesman. People feel they they feel that uh, you know like digital printing is easy or digital printing is easy as far as some aspect of printing is concerned. But we there is no escape from from the textile chemistry of it, and especially when you're using reactive or acid or dispersings which is you know steamed and washed. There is no escape from the textile chemistry, and the fabric has to be prepared. And as I told, as as we had seen earlier, there is when you print directly on the fabric, the fabric has to be prepared. It has to be uh, chemically treated. It has to be primed for digital print. This is very important. Uh, the, you might have noticed that there is a block of yellow here, which says drying. On drying, I have is is actually. When you buy a machine from Colorjet, drying is part of the printing machine. But some manufacturers offer this as an optional uh, equipment. As far as Colorjet goes, the policy, we, we consider a printing machine as a fabric feeding, printing, and drying all in one. Drying is not making the ink permanent. Or making the ink permanent, you still need to fix it. In case of pigment, you need to treat it with the high 161, 70 degree uh, centigrade te temperature. But the fabric does not that is coming from the machine is dry. Yeah, so why pretreatment? The drop size is so small. Pretreatment is needed because what we need is we need the fabric, we need the ink drops, not we don't want the ink drops to spread. If you if you these are all water-based inks and if you get water-based inks, water-based color on cotton it is it will tend to the capillary action will tend to spread it around you will probably have something like this a splash but what we need is a dot we need a precise dot on the fabric and this is what this is what we do with rft we treat the fabric with a mix of chemicals alginate urea etc etc to so that the fabric so that the, the ink that is jetted remains within the confines of the boundary that we intended to we don't want it to spread. And we don't want there to be a tonal variation either. We also need good color depth. So it not only has to, the dot, the ink dot not only has to stay where we want it to stay and not uh, spread around, but it also needs to retain its color. Only then do you get sharp images. Okay, the why of digital printing? Why, why do we need digital printing? Because what you can do with digital printing, you cannot do on conventional printing. That is the simple answer. So the very fact that you, you have digital printing is because is beyond, you cannot create, you know, like for example, in digital printing, you can have a repeat size, which is as long as you want. It could be as long as a train. You could start with the engine of the train and it could run for 10 meters and you end up with the, the last bogey of the train. So that's what digital printing is about. If you can rip, if you can make that long a file, you can print it on the digital printer. Uh, it also, um, yeah, because registration is not an issue with digital printer. So it actually mimics yarn dyed fabric with prints. I'll show you an example in, in the last slide that I have. Repeat size no limit. Oh, very important is what is of growing importance actually. Very important, and it's the importance is growing more and more. Is that digital printing is cleaner? In fact, at ITMA uh, last year, June 2020, Colorjet positioned one of its models, the Vastrajet, as a digital inkjet printer with the lowest carbon footprint. When we say that it's the lowest carbon footprint, it means Less energy, less water, less dye, less chemicals. I mean. Cost of printing, a very important question. Cost of printing is high. You cannot look at digital printer as a low cost uh, printing system. Cost of printing on, on a digital inkjet printer is high. 
primarily because the ink is expensive. Of course, we are continuously working on it. And as we saw that example of digital watch getting gave earlier, we are, we are continuously working on the cost of printing to come down. It has already, it has been coming down all these years and hopefully it will come down even more. So there are a lot, a lot of costs involved and these are something that you need to consider. Yeah, uh, here I would like to point out that uh, it is not okay. You can buy RFD fabric from the market, but so can a conventional printing person. They can also buy a RFD fabric. So it's not really your 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 you it, it, you may have you you are actually outsourcing that process. You are it's not elim being eliminated. Digital printing does not mean you are eliminating certain processes in, in fabric processing. You are not eliminating eliminating steps in the fabric process. What you are can do is you are outsourcing those steps. So when you buy RFD fabric, and when a digital printing person buys RFD fabric, he is actually outsourcing everything. He's paying for it, and he is paying for it. Paying for RFD fabric, and he's paying for all the scarring and desizing and etc. And the singeing as well. So, who should invest in digital printing? Existing fabric process houses, yes, because it's very easy for them. They have everything. They have stenters, they have blue pages, they have they have washing lines, they have everything in place. I'm not saying existing print houses have massive capacities in conventional printing or even fabric dyeing houses they should shift to digital printing no sir i'm not saying that what i'm saying is that if you have 100 if you have uh, a th if you want if you're selling 1000 meters of printed fabric 5% of this is can probably be done digital it can go digital the important part is digital printing is not an alternate method uh, system of printing it is complementary to the conventional printing it is not it has not replaced conventional printing and i i don't see it replacing conventional printing i mean as far as i see in the next two three five years it, it is not replacing i mean there can be a lot of forces it has a lot of tailwind digital printing has a lot of tailwind and most important is the is the green the, the being a greener technology than conventional printing that is the most important tailwind it has, but it's not going to replace conventional printing anytime soon. But for the existing fabric process houses, for the existing conventional printing houses, it is important to understand that you know you your customer, will, people with whom you have a relationship, sooner or later he'll come to you and say, "Listen, can you also print this?" And that this that 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 what he tells you to print might be. Very difficult to do on your uh, conventional printing system, and you, or maybe impossible to do it in a conventional system. And that is why you need a digital printer also in your, because it, 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 it your product mix has to cover that digital printing on. For that reason, it is easy for fabric process houses to go for digital printing because they have everything in place. They know printing, they know fabric, they know everything else. They just need maybe 30 square meters to put put in a digital printer, and they are. I'm not saying, and because it is high value, because the digital printing is more expensive, you will not be able to convert everyone. You will be able to convert, or you will be able to, uh, maybe you will, if you're selling 1,000 meters of printed fabric every day, maybe you will be able to sell 1,005, 1,050 meters of digital printers, printed fabric every day, and out of which 50 meters would be digital, digital again. But that those 50 meters would be uh, uh, a premium product. That's how I look at it for the existing printing, conventional printing business. Garment makers, yes, for garment makers, it's it's backward innovation. But again, you have to consider a few things. Uh, fashion creators, this is what uh, is very interesting because they are, they are the ones who are who are the creative people. They want their designs to be unique. And for them, digital print, printer is exactly what the doctor ordered. If they can invest in a digital printing unit, total, I mean, there are units in India which, which occupy uh, what, maybe uh, 100 square meters, and they are they're already printing. And it can be multi level as well. 
Sometimes you need to print odd lots, as Kevin earlier said. Five meters is no problem in Google. Five meters in 10 different colors, same design, no problem at all. Digital printer will, will probably not charge you anything, except for the, for the creative uh, exercise that, that is more. And therefore, overall, the waste also is much less. Again, it goes into the greener part of you know, digital printing being the greener technology. Low waste is also green technology. It is, also means it's greener. A lot of startups, people who were not into textiles, for them, doing something in textile is, if, if somebody wants, if somebody outside the textile industry, you know, like uh, Yogesh just mentioned that he, that uh, the STC was instituted in, not in the 20th century, but in the 19th century. And this is how old, how mature the textile industry is. And for today to somebody, somebody to start, get into textile industry, to start a spinning mill or a weaving unit or something like that, involves a very high capital investment. Whereas in digital printing, if you want to get into textile, the digital inkjet printer is, you know, works very well because it's new technology. Nobody knows enough about it. So there is no competitive edge. Well, of course, you a textile person will always have a competitive edge, but you know, this, this, is, this, is, this, is, a, this is a game changer. Digital inkjet printing in textile has been a game changer. And you can enter it and you can change, you can set your own rules. The whole, whole uh, uh, the business uh, uh, model is standing on its head today because of digital printing. That is the reason why you have such uh, printers as Spoonflower. If you have not seen, you just go and have a look at that website Spoonflower. This is a US company, American company, and they are selling printed products. A lot can be discussed about new people who want to enter into textile. The most important part here in digital printing is that it's, a, it's more expensive. So you have, what you're doing is you're creating value and you must understand that you have created value. As, this is the reason why I showed the textile, we call it the textile value chain and digital inkjet printing adds value. It adds value and you have to understand the value that you're adding. And most important, you have to communicate this value. Only then does your does does the business work. If you're only creating value but you're not communicating value, it doesn't help. A mistake that often people do. I mean, this is uh, I will I will take some more time here. A mistake that people often do is they ask for uh, digital inkjet printer uh, samples. They take the samples and they show it to their buyers. Well, listen, uh, what do you think of these samples? Buyers, oh, fantastic. I'll. I'll uh, I will buy if you can print print something like this for me. Sure, but uh, can you wait for uh, two months? Because I, if you are going to buy this from me, uh, you have to wait for two months and I'll set up my shop and then you can buy from me. Yeah, sure. But in the process, you have already given him that idea. You have introduced your buyer who was hitherto buying your 10 color or 20 color digital prints from you. You have introduced to him something fantastic, something which looks totally different from what you could deliver. You have introduced that idea, that concept to him, and you are asking him to wait for two months. Do you think he will wait for two months? I leave that to you. You know the buyer. So <clears throat> choosing a printer. Choosing a print, uh, how, do you, how do you decide which printer is good for me? You can collect brochures and uh, catalogs and do a lot of research. But at the end of it, you will want to know, you should have know what you want to print on, how much you want to print, at what rate you want, want to print. And then you have to see what ink system is best suited for you because it's all linked. Uh, product mix, I mean, what is what will be your product mix like? Are you going to print uh, just uh, 45 inch fabric? Or are you also going to print 60 inch fabric? Are you going to print uh, print uh, fabrics for uh, women or are you going to print uh, or you, are you also going to uh, do some fast fashion uh, printing? Fast fashion is again small quantities very quickly on the market. Fast fashion is a term that was coined that, that came about only because of digital printing. I mean digital printing has brought about some new terms. And then how well does it does digital printing 
gel with your business model. It's not for everyone. Digital print, printing is not for everyone. In fact, I have uh, written uh, an article also that where I'm saying, and I'm, I'm, I'm from Collegiate. My job is to sell Collegiate digital in the printer. But I am saying digital in your printer is not for everyone. This, and this is a matter of discussion. You have to engage with a salesperson, a reliable salesperson, who will tell you, okay, I mean, he has to understand what you want to do, where you come from, what your needs are, and then decide, yes, you should go for digital printers or not. And then there can be external factors, of course, that are, you know, those are for any other, for any business. What's going on in the world? What's going on in the world is uh, what Kevin showed, showed was a figure of around 40,000 printers installed. Now this, uh, this does not include, this figure is uh, from digital textile, uh, digital textile printing placements. Uh, you know, InfoTrends is, is another market research company which does, collects this kind of data. It's a little outdated, but uh, you, have, you get the picture. So most of the printers are in this, in this zone. Now, when I say this zone, it is uh, the printing speed is less than 80 square meters per hour or maybe 300 square meters per hour. So most of the printers are in this zone, less than 300 square meters per hour. There are a lot of printers, not yet in three figures, which are printing more than 600 square meters per hour. And this is, this is where single pass machines will come. And single pass machines are probably still in the double digits worldwide. I'm not talking about India, but worldwide probably that is in single, in double digits. Now, there's so many printers in the market. This is just the color jet range. You are spoiled for choice. Which printer should you go for? You have everything here. You have, I've given you all the technical details on this chart and one, this one chart. And yet, Unlike, okay, there is a, a divergence that, from what Gavin said, the speed of each of this, each model is actually from 61 to 350 or from 14 to 24. So it depends. So it's not like, I mean, and yet you have to decide. So again, that is the reason why I say you have to engage with a reliable salesperson to decide what solution works best for you. Uh, this, is, this is the slide that I promised that I, earlier, which I would show. This is what I call, I mean, the fabric is printing, this digital printing here, this photo here, is mimicking fabric dyeing with prints. It's very sharp printing. It's unfortunately, I cannot show you the fabric, but just the image. Very sharp printing, a, a flower pattern, floral pattern, on fabric that looks like as if it has been dyed green first. This here would be, a, you know, a yarn dyed, uh, shirting kind of a thing, a checks or stripes. What you see here, this, this portion, the leopard print, the, the, this color, multicolored uh, motif here, and all these sandals, the shoe layer. This is on one fabric. This fabric is warp knit. It is warp knit and it is, you know, it, is, it was almost uh, three millimeter thick. But this here is normal, you know, could be uh, satin or normal 60s into 60s or 40s into 60s, 40s kind of fabric. But here was a polyester fabric, which was, when I held it in my hand, was around three, three millimeter thick. It was warp knit, and it was 100% polyester. And we printed, this, it was printed with a direct to fabric, dispersed print, and dispersing. Something similar, I mean, David mentioned that you cannot print too much, too many fabric, Types. So that's the reason why I need to mention the kind of fabric that we are. One, some of some of our uh, um, you know customers, college uh, machine customers, are even printing dari. Dari's are like uh, rugs, which are you know, cotton rugs, which are uh, which are printed piece by piece, not even in roll. Some some of the printers are printed on embroidered uh, silk sarees. Sarees, uh, you know, uh, probably everybody knows what a saree is, and a silk saree. First embroidered with metallic yarn, Durex yarn, and, and then printed on the digital printer, piece by piece, five meter, six meter, whatever is the length of the sari, each, each piece is printed. That's also something that, you know, that's the kind of customization that some of the digital, uh, some of our customers are doing. Uh, 
this over here, this rectangle over here, is actually 100% polyester, plush fabric. It's like a teddy towel fabric, but it's warp knit. It has loops, and it was printed with a, it was printed with sublimation ink, heat transfer. So, and you can see that there is hardly any white peaking on in the fabric also, in the photo and also in the fabric. What you see here is actually a, a king size uh, bed sheet. It's been you know, compressed in this photograph. What you can see is one pillow here, pillow cover, the second one, and a bed sheet which has just one design from this corner to that corner, diagonally. It's single repeat, say around whatever is bed sheet size, 2.8 meters or something, that wide, and single design from that corner to this corner. So it is around a five meter probably a five meter distance from this to this corner. And this is printed on digitally as well with reactor ink incident. This is cotton. This is high end 300 thread count sheeting. So that's about it from uh, me. Uh, You're welcome to write to me. Uh, you have, can also see my phone number, the WhatsApp number in case you want to reach out. So Yogesh, uh, that's it from me, my presentation. And uh, 